Hi there folks, welcome back to the Overnight Efficient channel. I hope you're doing really, really well. A bit of a slightly different video today, but something I've been meaning to do for a wee while. I've seen a few other of these videos posted and I've always really interested. It's one of those videos I always like to watch, particularly with other guides or with competition anglers and stuff like that. I love it when people kind of open up the tackle boxes, open up the packs and share with the world exactly what kind of kit they're carrying with them, why they carry it with them, and exactly the kind of tactics they're looking to employ using the kit they've got in the bag. Before we get started, please make sure you've given the channel a subscribe in the little area just below. That way you'll be kept in touch when we upload more videos. We've got some cool stuff coming. I'm not going to waffle too much. I want to crack straight in on this one because there's loads of stuff to cover. It was only when I just had a quick look at my pack that I realised just how much stuff there is. Tucked away in my chest and backpack combo there. So first thing to mention here is that it is a chest and backpack combo and those of you who watch the channel will be looking at this thinking well I don't think I've ever really seen you wear that Andy that's ridiculous and the reason you don't see me wear this during the videos is because the chest pack sits on me exactly where the GoPro will go so <laughs> when we're filming I actually just carry it with me I've always got it with me I've always got the stuff that's in here with me I just don't wear it while we're filming because I need to wear the GoPro on my chest. I've tried wearing a GoPro on my head, I don't like the footage, I tried it on a shoulder, it was never really looking where I wanted it to. So while we're filming, I just carry it on the bank with me, but it is always there. So this is the older version of the William Joseph Confluence chest and backpack. Uh, and I'll, I'll be perfectly honest, straight from the start here, I don't like wearing vests or packs. If there was another way of doing it that would keep me this organized without having to wear this, I would do it because I, I don't like having stuff on me or around me while I'm fishing and casting. The problem is I haven't found another way and it does keep me really organized. It keeps everything that I need exactly on me. It's a brilliant piece of kit. As I say, this one's the older version. There are newer versions now that I'll link in the description box below. In fact, all the stuff that I talk about today, I'll, I'll try and make sure there's a link in the description box for you. I'll also link, uh, which would did a, a pretty close copy of this. It's, it's very close actually, and it's a little bit cheaper. It does pretty much the same stuff. I really like it. It keeps me organized. If there was another way I'd use it, but that is my best worst case scenario and I'm really grateful I've got it with me. It keeps me on the ball and keeps everything exactly where I need it. And there is so much stuff on here, but not loads of pockets. I've tried wearing a vest in the, in the past and I just found there was too many pockets. You know, there's stuff everywhere. I never knew exactly where something was. Cause I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not the kind of guy who will take something out of that pocket and then put it straight back in there. I'll take it out of that pocket. I'll hold it in my teeth. I'll put it on the bank. I'll put it back in that pocket. I'll never find it again. But actually this thing only has one, two pockets on the front. There are only two places where anything can really go in here, which for me is great because it means I know exactly where it is. It's in one of those two or I've dropped it in the river. Before I open any of the pockets, I think we'll start with the stuff that's hanging on the outside. Real simple stuff. You can see on here, built into the pack, there's a zinger on which I've got a set of debarbing pliers stroke forceps and they've even got a little hook eye cleaner in the middle there. That's pretty straightforward stuff. Everyone will have those. On this side, on the built-in zinger, down here, I've got two pots of Loon Strikeout or equivalent indicator fluff. Now, this is stuff I don't use lots during the trout season, but every now and again, if we're fishing the duo and we want to fish somewhere slightly deeper, if the wind's got up too strong and we're struggling to use the French leader, actually, I will switch to the fluffy stuff. And if I open that up, yeah, there we go. There's plenty of orange fluff in there, as well as the clear tubing you need to be able to make the New Zealand indicator system. But I've got one in front of me that's already made. Nice piece of fluff there, ready to go. You'll hold up a couple of three mil beads on that, no problem at all. So I've got two pots of those. There'll be different colors in there. I think there'll be some of the original New Zealand wool in there as well. So you see slightly different colors. There's some black, there's some green in there. Just makes it easy to see. As I say, it's not something I use lots of during the summer in truth. I'd rather use the duo, particularly when the water's low. It's the middle of August at the moment. Every now and again, if there's a bit of rain, you know, if we get a bit of colour come down and we need some heavier flies that are going to get deeper, but we're in situations where we can't use the French leader, that's the way to go. Also on there, a bit less visible, is a safety pin with a load of tippet rings on. Now, anyone who watched our um, video that we made about my three favourite river rigs will know that I love using tippet rings. Uh, for rigging rather than using water knots. I much prefer tippet rings. I find them far more versatile. And for all the French leader rigging stuff that we do during the summer and during the winter, I'll always have these on there. So tippet rings are an absolute must for me. They're kept on there 
I've got a little stock box that I keep in the car. It's got some more in as well. I've always got tippet rings on me. They're an absolute must. I've got a, a Sims retractor here. It's, I, I want to say it's the safest one I've found. I, I don't like retractors. I particularly don't like the springy ones. Uh, I much prefer this on a coil because the springs eventually give up. I've seen it time and time again. I haven't found a good one of those. I want to say it's safe. I actually lost a pair of Able nips off here, which at nigh on 100 quid is pretty bloody annoying. So even the Sims one isn't totally infallible. It just came un unhooked while I was in the River Dee. And the next time I went to change some flies, my snips weren't there, which is really annoying. So you notice there's a slightly cheaper pair of sips on there. These are the TMCO ceramic bladed ones. They're pretty good. I get on okay with those, particularly with lighter tippet. There's another pot with some different strike out in there. Again, different colors. That's all it'll be. A bit more tubing, a few different colors again. Also on there is one of my absolute most important pieces of kit. This is something I really couldn't do without. It's something you'll have seen IB and I use in the past, and it's something that when I'm with clients always raises a few eyebrows. It's what, what I find is the very best way of getting a dry fly dry again, particularly CDC dries, which are prone to getting a bit clogged up and stuff like that. This is a bit of a hack, but I've been doing this for a long time now, and I'm convinced still that it's the very best way of getting a dry fly dry. There are three or four elastic bands on there, and that is how I dry my dry flies. So you would take your sodden dry fly, hook it round the elastic band, pull it tight and give it a dozen real good pings. And you'll see it happen in real time. The water that's on that fibre, on that feathery fibre, on the CDC, whatever it is, will ping off. And after 10 seconds of doing that, you will have a perfectly dry fly. Now, obviously, this doesn't have the same issues with uh, clogging up with water or going off like Amadou does. It's not expensive like a Ruby Cell fly dry or something like that. It is absolutely brilliant. It's bargain basement. I haven't found a better way of getting flies dry. Little tip for you, the very best elastic bands for doing this with I've found, and I've been with a few now, are the ones they use to bind asparagus together. They just seem a little bit tougher than your regular common garden elastic band. So if you're into your asparagus or know anyone who grows it, get hold of the little blue elastic bands. They're the perfect thing for drying flies. That's a right little hack that usually people really enjoy. It's a good one to have. On top of that, on the outside of the bag, as well as having those to dry the flies, the other part of the system is this stuff, Hunt's Dry Dust, absolutely fantastic. Again, I would ping the fly first, always I would ping the fly first to get the worst of the water off, then you go in with this stuff, it's a little pop with a brush on the end, and you just work that in to the fibres, really get stuck in with that. It doesn't coat it, it, you know, it's not like a gink or something like that that coats it in slimy stuff, it's a desiccant, it just wicks away the rest of the moisture, and between the elastic band pinging and a little bit of Hunt's Dry Dust, that will get your dry fly totally dry every time. That's on the front of the pack. That is everything that we've looked at. I, I try and keep this really simple. There might not be as much stuff in this video as some of the other people who've done this video, but that's possibly because I'm quite a simple bloke. My brain can't handle too much stuff. I like to keep it nice and simple, nice and clean, not too much stuff. The little pocket on the front, I'm gonna pop that one open. And in there will be a pot of muslin, which is what I use for drying my field leaders. I do the vast majority of my dry fly fishing with field leaders and they do need dressing regularly with muslin, so probably three times a session. A little bit of that, I'll just run it straight through the pot. I don't, I don't bother with the little pad, in fact. I'll open that up. There's a little pad in there. I don't use that. I just run it straight through the middle of the muslin, to be honest, and that's absolutely fine. I do get through quite a lot of muslin, particularly when it's hot. It's a couple of quid a pot. Absolute essential for the field leaders. Also in there is my tippet. I only carry Three breaking strains to tip it with me. There's some 5X there, which is 5.1. There is 6X there, which is 3.6. And there is 7X there, which is 2.4. And for trout and grayling fishing, that is literally all I use. Possibly with the exception, maybe if I was going streamer fishing, I would take some heavier stuff. I'd maybe take some 10 or 12 pound fluoro. But in terms of uh, dry and dropper, duo, dry fly, French leader, three breaking strains, that's all I carry with me, nice and simple. Uh, it is fluorocarbon. I don't get the same issues with knotting that some people get with fluorocarbon. I meet a lot of clients who say, yeah, I tried fluoro, but it was too brittle. I didn't like the knots. For some reason, I don't get that issue. I find it knots just as well, if not better than copolymer. I like the invisibility aspect of it. I'm, I'm big on that. And it's super abrasion resistant. And you've seen in videos, I being high, I've had big fish that have shot under trees and stuff like that. We might not have got away with those fish if we were using copolymer because it doesn't have that abrasion resistance. Fluorocarbon does. So for me, it's the way to go. Also in there, pair of scissors, you know what it's like on the river. Uh, to be honest, these probably get used more when I'm taking other people's line out of trees and cutting it up than they actually do with my own rigging. They, they get used very little, but you've got to have a pair of scissors in your pack just in case. And that is it for that little front pocket. That's that whole one done. Now the big pocket. This is the, this is the money maker. This is where all the really important stuff 
sits with me. And obviously, first two things, two fly boxes. Nymph box, dry fly box. That is all the flies I carry for a session. That's it. I don't carry any more than these two boxes. And I think this is one of the absolute minefields for a beginner. I don't know how a, a, a newbie, particularly to river fly fishing, would ever get a selection of flies right because there is a breadth of different flies on the market. There's hundreds, thousands of different flies and every magazine is telling you you've got to have this fly and this fly and if you go into this river you must have this fly. No, 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 none of that. Keep it simple. So this is my kind of midsummer box. There's a row of terrestrials on there, there's some beetles, there's a couple of hawthorns, you know, they, they still work actually right the way through the summer hawthorns. And then there's one, two, three, four, five rows of caddis of different sizes and shapes, but they are only one insect, they're only caddis. And then we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, six and a half rows of various size and shapes of olive emergers, duns, spinners ranging from a size 14 to a size 20 at this time of year with fish slightly smaller. Down at the bottom there, there's a few canis, there's a couple of aphids and stuff like that, real picky stuff, but this is a very simple fly box. As I say, I'm a pretty simple bloke. If, I, if this was too complicated, I wouldn't be able to do it. So I like to keep this nice and easy. And it's gonna be exactly the same with the nymph box. So in here, we've got one, two, three, four, five, five and a half rows of caddis nymphs. There's a, a couple of stray pink tags in there that I had to pick up the other day. They're basically all caddis nymphs. There's half a row here of freshwater shrimps, and then there are one, two, three, four, five and a half rows of what are essentially uh, olive nymphs, baited nymphs, uh, heptagenid nymphs, upwing insect nymphs. Nice and simple. The bottom two and a half rows there are spiders, and actually I, I haven't done much spider fishing this year. I like to do that early in the season. It's really simple. It's really clean. All there is is a lot of the same flies, but in different weights. I'd rather have patterns that I've got confidence in in a range of weights and sizes rather than have hundreds of different patterns. It just gets too confusing. So that between those two boxes is my entire mid to late season trout fly selection. That's it, that's all I need. I use the old school tacky boxes, I really like them. Nice and solid, dependable, super grippy. So <laughs> I just shook that and the fly came loose. They are super grippy, I promise. Don't think you can get the old school ones anymore, but I'm sure the new ones are just as good. I'll make sure I try and find these and link them in the description box. If not, I'll link the new ones because they'll be just as good. So that is that, two fly boxes, that'll be the money maker. In here, we've got a pot of hunts up high. It's kind of a gink type thing, similar type thing. It doesn't get used a whole lot, to be honest, and may well put a little dip of this on the parachute of a clink hammer or something like that, particularly when I'm fishing the duo at the start of the session. Um, but I don't put much on there, to be honest. It's not something that gets used a huge amount. Sometimes if you've got a braided leader loop that's really, really sinky, you can coat it in this and it'll, it'll keep it up. I keep it in there just in case it doesn't get a huge amount of use in truth. Uh, <laughs> We are in the coronavirus at the moment. That in there is 85% alcohol hand sanitizer. I keep that on me while I'm guiding and while I'm fishing at the moment. Obviously, usually that wouldn't be there, but at the moment that one's super important. A second pot of Hunt's Original, a spare, just in case I get through a lot of this stuff through guiding. Um, one of the venues I guide on is a dry flow only river. So all day we're fishing dries, you know, they're getting drowned and stuff like that. So second pot of that, and I actually keep a few more pots in the car as well. Another slightly different float and Fulham Mill High Ride. Now I'll compare these two. The Hunts comes with the brush and is very, very fine powder and you can work that into areas of fly that you want to float. So if I was fishing a curved shank emerger, I wouldn't want to get that floating on the body of the fly. I'd only want to get it on the wing because I want the body to sit just under the surface. So that's really, really cool for working into a particular area of a fly. High Ride is different. It's a big pot, he says. You drop the fly in there, you kind of close the pot over it, give it a good shake, and that'll coat the whole thing. So if I need something to really, really float high, if I want something to sit right above the surface, I'll use the high ride. It's a slightly coarser powder than the Hunt's original. And as I say, it's great for coating the whole breadth of a fly rather than just selecting an area. And then there are only four other things in here, and these are to do with the French leader. These are four waxes that I use uh, I must admit, for my own fishing, I very rarely use a regular just French leader indicator anymore. I actually use these waxes. You paint them on. And the nice thing about this is because they're not fixed on like a normal indicator. You can paint them on and then you can rub them out and paint them on somewhere else. So if the depth is changing throughout the day, it's really versatile. I don't use these a lot with clients because they're quite difficult to see. Um, you know, might have some elderly clients or people who haven't done a lot of French leader before and they're struggling to pick up the indicator. It can be harder with these. 
in the right light, they are really, really visible. Uh, there's a bit of a knack to paint in them on. You want to make sure you get them on nice and heavy. But I keep these to hand because throughout the course of a day's fishing, I will be rubbing out my indicator and then paint it on, on another section. So that's those four. And I'll show you this. That is the lot. That's everything I keep on my front during the trout season. I must admit, during the grayling season, there'll be a few other bits, and I'll probably do another one of these during the winter. But for the trout season, that is absolutely everything that I carry on my chest. I don't feel like I need anything more than that with me. It's super simple. Before I go on to the backside, before I go on to the backside, before I go on to the backpack side of things, uh, IB and I went down and filmed some chalk stream fishing. We're really, really excited to share this with you. We've got a little mini chalk stream series coming very, very soon. It should be out within the next few days. So keep an eye on the channel, make sure you're subbed, uh, and we're going to roll a little bit of footage from here to get you guys super excited about the next few vlogs. Yes! Second huge trout in a beautiful chalk stream in a beautiful day. We are on what would be regarded as the most famous streams in the whole of England, if not some of the most famous trout streams in the entire world. Yep. Big fish. Big fish. That's the that's the big one. Oh my god, it's massive. It's huge. Yes, yes, and gotcha. Yes! Beautiful brownie. But we're gonna get this guy straight back because we've got more fish to catch. Got him that time. Got him that time. Oh my goodness, what a scrap that was. And what a fish. It's so stunning and beautiful here. The fact that you can see these fish and you can see how they act. You have the sound of the river and a nice hut, nice lovely day. It's just been a true blessing today, hasn't this it? This is a really so nice. beautiful piece of water tucked away. We had a bloody brilliant time down there. And again, thank you to Pete McLeod. Thank you to Simon Cooper. Thank you to the guys at Fishing Breaks. It was brilliant. We really enjoyed it. Some amazing fish, some amazing footage. That's coming super soon. So make sure you're subbed to the channel and you'll get the notifications as soon as those videos start dropping. Right, so backpack. There are a few bits attached to the back of this backpack that I'm going to start with. The first off is this. Now, you know what social media is like, it can be difficult. Uh, IB and I do quite a lot of the old grip and grim photos and we do get a little bit of heat for it. I'm fine with that, it's social media. It is what it is, we're gonna get heat for it. I've seen very few, in fact, I'm gonna change that. I've seen one other angler ever on a non-wading piece of river who carries unhooking mats. And I just don't understand why it isn't a thing in fly fishing. Course anglers are absolutely all over this with regards to fish care. As game anglers, we like to think we are too, but I can't understand why on a no wading piece of river, everyone isn't carrying an hooking mat. IB and I have always got ours with us on the Y. We took them down to the chalk streams as well. This should just be a thing. So if I'm on a no wading piece of river like the Derbyshire Y or down on the chalk streams or something like that, it's like 10 or 12 quid. It's there, you can get it nice and wet, it's lightweight, it's super simple. Personally, I think everyone should be carrying an unhooking mat. That's me off my soapbox. Obviously, if you're wading, it's not so much of an issue because you're in the water with the fish. You can do stuff with them. But on a no-wading piece of river, you know, it doesn't weigh anything. Carrying an unhooking mat is good for the fish. There are a couple of other things attached to the back that I want to talk about. Um, it's two different magnets. So I've got a little magnet up here. This is one of the Sierra 3 kilo magnets, which is what I use to attach my floating net to. You can see there's a magnet at the top there, just in front of my face. So the handle, I like the handle hanging down. It makes it easy to grab. The net doesn't weigh anything. So the three kilo magnet there is plenty. A bit further down, there's another one. This is one of the Sierra five kilo magnets. And this is the one I use for carrying my net for when we can't wade. So I've got one of the McLean's extending nets here with rubber mesh. Nice big net. We catch some big fish out of the Y. It extends out. It's important that we've got that extra reach. Again, I'll link these in the description box below. That's the three things that I keep attached to the back. So main pocket here. 
Bottle of water, generally always have that with me. Obviously super important during the summer to keep hydrated, so always have a bottle of water with you, that's important. Same thing with the sunscreen, a little bit geeky. This child's farm stuff is amazing. IB and I got scorched while we were in Hampshire. We didn't actually burn because of this stuff. I'm not, I'm not a suntan lotion geek, I don't have shares in child's farm. This stuff was incredible. I usually burn like a crisp. I didn't burn when I was wearing this, so really good, really important. And then there's actually, there is a set of Little Reuben Heaton scales in here. They very rarely get used. I'm not really a weigher, but just in case you know you catch the fish for a lifetime, I have got a set of scales there that go up to 12 pounds. Maybe one day we might get somewhere near that, but probably not in the UK. <laughs> uh, then a couple of bits in here. These are full and mill pinch on strike indicators. I really like the pinch on indicators. They're super versatile. And again, if we get a situation where we need to fish heavier flies than we can usually with the duo, I just pinch one of these onto the line or a couple of these onto the line and they'll hold up a reasonably heavy nymph or a couple of reasonably heavy nymphs in pretty miserable conditions. These have got me out of trouble with the French leader when it's too windy and it's blowing the indicator around. For a couple of quid, I like having these in the pack. So that's everything in that one. The middle pack there, yep, there we go. God knows how long that's been in there, but there's a little granola bar in there, a little protein bar, uh, just to keep me ticking over. I like my sugar while I'm fishing, really important to keep yourself not only hydrated, but keep yourself fed as well. You'll fish better if you're not hungry. And down in here, this is basically just spares, to be honest. So if I go through here, there are some spare, regular French leader braided indicators. Always have those with me, just in case there's an issue with a French leader, you never know what's gonna go wrong. A spare 12 foot tapered leader for the duo. Again, you never know what's going to happen. It's always good to have a spare one with you rather than leaving it all in the car. A spare filled leader. We do all our dry fly fishing now on filled leaders. I like to keep one of those with me. These generally don't go wrong. They last for ages, but just in case, it's good to have one with you. There is in here a spare French leader with an indicator attached. And just on this little foam disc, and I'll make sure I get a better shot of this for you, there, are, there is a fully rigged French leader system from the bottom of the indicator down to the flies. So if it's really cold or if something drastically goes wrong, all I need to do is uncurl this and we're fishing again straight away. I haven't got to re-rig the whole system. Really handy that. Particularly useful in winter with the grayling fishing when it's freezing cold. You know, your hands are gone and you, you, you don't want to tie seven or eight different knots to get re-rigged. Having one re-rigged on one of these little foam discs is really important for me. There's a headlight in there, a little Petzl headlight that attaches to my cap. Doesn't seem very bright at the moment, but it is. Stretches out there. So, you know, if it's very, very dark, I can stick that on my bonds. I can still tie knots. I can find the car. I can find IB if she's got lost. And then there are four spools here. There is a spool of 6X fluorocarbon, spool of 5X fluorocarbon, spool of 7X fluorocarbon, and there's a spool of bicolour indicator stuff. So I've actually got three different indicator systems here for the French leader. As, as much of this is for me, some of this is for clients. And if I've got a client who's struggling to see the smaller indicators, sometimes uh, a yard of this is a bit more visible, particularly more visible than the waxes. But I actually carry three different French leader indicator systems with me. As much for clients as much for me, uh, but it's good to have these bits and pieces with you just in case, because if you get in a situation where you've got a pool that you're catching fish out of, or you think you can catch fish out of, you need to be able to see that indicator, and there's nothing more frustrating than not being able to see it. So guys, that is it. That is my pack. Absolutely empty. There's now nothing in there. I've made myself a job here, haven't I? I've got to put everything back in. That really is it. It, it might seem a little bit simple. I know I've, I've certainly watched uh, videos that have got more stuff in than this, and I'll probably carry a little bit more when I'm guiding, just in terms of rigging bits and pieces. Obviously, I would have a throw rope with me, first aid kit, all that stuff. I will often have a uh, little Sims packable jacket that I keep in the back. I can pack it down to like the size of a coat can, just in case we get a shower. I can throw that on. But that really is it. I try and keep this as simple as possible. There's plenty of stuff here that I could leave behind, particularly if I'm fishing somewhere like the Derbyshire Wild, which is dry fly only during the trout season. I wouldn't take the nymph box. I wouldn't take the uh, indicator stuff. I wouldn't take the French leader stuff. It would be really, really simple. And that's kind of the take home I, I want to get from this is try and keep this as simple as you can. Have flies you're confident in, simple patterns that you're confident in. Just the amount of tippet that you need. I've seen guys carrying like eight or nine spools of tippet. I, just, I, I can't work out why you'd ever need that much. Maybe the guys who are making their own French leaders on the fly, but even then, surely you'd have them pre-made up rather than trying to do it on the bank. Some floating that you're confident in. Try the elastic band 
uh, fly drying trick. It is a game changer. Uh, French leader indicator stuff, as I say, I've perhaps gone a bit over the top having three different indicator systems, but I like to be prepared for different light situations. On the subject of light, actually, that's something that's important. Have that with you. Other safety stuff, have your phone with you just in case you get in trouble while you're on the river. That'll be in a, in a wader pocket, or you could perhaps put it in your, in your chest pack as well, in a dry pack. Nice, simple, easy solutions. Don't overcomplicate this, guys. It doesn't need it. As long as you're doing technically the fishing stuff right, you don't need the million flies. You don't need all the tippy. You don't need all that stuff. Just a small pack like this with a few bits and pieces, all the essentials. That's all you need. As I said, I'll try to find links for everything that's here in the description box. I know some of the stuff isn't made. I know they don't make the pack anymore. They've changed the fly boxes, but I'll do my very best to put links in the description box so you guys can you know, pick up bits and pieces if you want. I probably won't give you links to the elastic bands. I think you can probably find those yourself. <laughs> Other than that, I'll do my best to find the links. Thank you very, very much for watching the vlog. Really appreciate it. If there's anything you've got out of this, please let us know in the comment section. If there's anything that I don't carry that you do, please feel free again, get involved in the comment section. Let me know what it is because there's always stuff that I could pick up, absolutely. Other than that, enjoy your fishing. I'll be and I'll see you very, very soon for some more fishing and stuff. Keep an eye out for the Hampshire vlogs that are coming up super soon and get out there and do some fishing while the weather's good. Take care, folks. Bye-bye.